I don't know what you would like to hear, what you would like me to talk about. If you have any questions, you can ask me or or what. I, mean, I, I can talk about what, whatever you like. So you tell me. If you want to hear about my life, okay. If you want to yeah. Yeah. hear about the monastery, okay, whatever. Yeah. My life? But it's a long one. But can you hear? No. You want to come to the Come, come look. It's okay. Better to come a bit closer. A bit spacious. Of course, the, the Bible has two, two, two answers to all the problems that you have. One is the law and one is grace. Okay? You can live by law or you can live by grace. So what I want to tell you is how God said to me, I will let you to live by grace. Maybe he will not give to everybody <coughs> the same grace. Everybody receives from God as much as God thinks they need. Not as much as you think you need, as much as God thinks you need. But I needed a lot of grace, so he gave me a lot. Huh? If you are stronger at the beginning, maybe he will not give you so much. Maybe you have to walk according to the law. It's harder to just to follow the law without grace, without the blessing of grace, the comfort of grace, just doing what the Bible tells you, do this, do this, do this. You remember St. Paul was always so worried about this. How can I live by the law? I can't live by the law. And he prayed and prayed right, for grace. Not only was I not living by the law, but I was outside the law before. I was not Christian at all. <coughs> 1990, 1989, I was not Christian. That means how many years now? 10, 15 years, right? 15 years ago, I was not Christian. I was pagan, not, not just pagan, atheist, you know? And not just atheist, but uh, aggressive against Jesus. You know? For example, I was teaching philosophy in the university. And I made one course for my students. It, I can make up any course which I like. Just if I teach them philosophy, that's what I have to do. So I took three books. Now, maybe you don't know them, but just I'll tell you what they are. The first one was a philosophy book by a German philosopher called Nietzsche, called Thus Spake Zarathustra. This is a book about a man who goes to the mountain, stays there for 10 years, becomes very wise and comes down and then teaches the people his wisdom. Okay? Like many Christian Orthodox monks. Right? The second one I chose was uh, the Bhagavad Gita. This is the story of Krishna, Indian God. Krishna was uh, a beautiful God. His body was beautiful, his face beautiful. He was uh, charming. He used to play with the girls in the forest. He was very loving. He was very strong and could fight them. And when his family started a war with another family, he came to help them, to fight with them. And the leader of the army said to him, Show me your glory. And he said, Okay, get ready. He showed him his glory. Like when Jesus went to Mount of Transfiguration. Okay. The third one was the Gospel of St. Luke. And I thought that, look, Zarathustra is good, okay? Because he's strong on his own. He goes and lives far away, and he, and he by meditation, by, by, he becomes as strong as the mountain that he is living in, and then when he comes down, he is wise. And he can, he can he, he is wiser than anyone. And he is powerful. By wisdom, he is powerful. Then Krishna, right? because he was a god. And when he showed himself to the general of the army, he was shining like light. And he was a winner, and they won the war. And then Jesus. Yeah. 
he's a carpenter, he's nobody, he's not even uh, educated, he's uh, lost the battle and he died, he's a loser. Okay. So I, I told my students, and who would choose Jesus? He would be stupid, you could choose maybe Zarathustra or you could choose Krishna, but you certainly wouldn't choose Jesus. Over and over again, whatever philosophy I was teaching them, everybody of course, I didn't lose any moment to say, Jesus is weak, Jesus didn't win, Jesus didn't uh, teach anything worth uh, surviving. Uh, like somebody who never, never stopped to criticize you, maybe you know somebody like that. They just, even whatever you do is wrong. Okay. So for me, whatever Jesus did was wrong, I had to criticize him. And I was teaching other things as well, like morality, you know, leave it, leave it to see. The fathers in the desert, they say, if somebody tired, put her head on your lap and you <laughs> Yeah. So, any, anything which I was teaching, like morals, you know, I said, what you want is good. You want something? Okay, take it. Huh? Don't, don't, if you can get away with it. As much as, much as your desire is, that much you should do. Huh? The limits of your of your life, your action are only the limits of your desire. Now this all of this philosophy, this is this is what you will find everywhere. Huh? I want this, okay take it. Huh? I want to be like this person, this person's great, this person is a winner. Huh? So we have role models who are who are leading us further and further and further away from sacrifice. And we have our desires which we don't want to sacrifice. So we are all the time pushed and by ourselves and by the forces outside us far away from Jesus. And I was far away from him. Then I was teaching in Australia. My mother and father lived in Tasmania, which is part of the south of Australia. My mother became very sick. Father called me on the telephone. I was in the class. So I was very angry when I came from the class. I said, why do you interrupt the class? I said, my mother is very sick. I told him, I'll call a doctor. Why he called me? So he called me after a week. He said, she's no better. I said, okay, change the doctor. Maybe this doctor is not. He called me after a few more days and said, she's dying. Okay, at this moment, he said this word to me. See, my mother, I was living with my sister, my big sister. She was teaching psychology and I was teaching philosophy at the same university. My mom used to write us letters every week. My sister take the letter and read it, give it to me. I take it, put it in the rubbish. Didn't read it, it was every week the same letter. Yeah. Such un unloving, and my heart was hard. You know, in the Bible that says, these people, they have a stiff neck. God said to Moses, I had a, like that. I was very, very self-centered, concentrating on my, what I wanted to see. When my father told me that my mother was dying, I, I didn't know how to find the meaning of this word. What does it mean that she's dying? I don't believe that she's dying. I couldn't accept it. He said to me, you have to come. Why? I couldn't, couldn't believe that something like this can come to me. And none of the philosophy which I knew answered the death. What is the answer for death? No, no philosophy can give you the answer for this. So in there, my mother didn't take the medicine. She took morphine, she had cancer in all of her body. The doctor wanted to give her morphine, but she said, no, if I take it, I'll go to sleep, right? He said, yes. She said, no, I want to see my son. So she waited two more days with the pain of the cancer so she could see me awake. Then when I came and I sat with her some time, I was crying most of the time, just couldn't believe it. And then she took the medicine and she passed into coma. And then people started to come, people I had never seen before. They started to come to say goodbye to her. On the first two or three visits I accepted them, I was sick of it. Why all these people are coming? I said to my father, who are they? He said, I don't know. So I said, okay, I'll find out. So the next person came, I asked him, why did you come here? Why you want to see my mother? 
every one of those people who came told me a story. One of them said that I can't read or write and your mother used to come and make my tax form for me every year. Another one said that my, your, your, my, my wife is paralyzed and your mother come and do the ironing. And every, every day she would go to school and teach till three o'clock. She never came home till seven. My sister always prepared the meal. From three o'clock to seven, where is she? My father, he does care. He is working and he doesn't care where is she. So we, we, none of us we knew where she was. But now we find out she's every day going and doing something for somebody. Serving these four hours every day going to some house, somebody who need her. I was amazed. Why? She's got a home, she's got family and children. Why she's going to look after another, another people? I couldn't understand it. It was not an idea which was acceptable to me. It became more angry. Why she died? And I couldn't go to the church. When the people came from the church, they said, don't worry, or your mother is going to heaven. I remember I said to them, I don't, I don't want your heaven, and I spit, I spit on them, on the people coming from the church. Because I was so angry. After so st time started to go by, after three months, four months, my sister became okay. They were all sad. My, my two sisters and my brother, they were a bit sad, but after some time they became better. Because they know that she's the spirit gone. But me, no. I still said, why my mother is dying? Why I haven't got a mother? I want a mother. I don't suppose I missed that woman because I didn't know her so much. Long time since I spent time with her. But I wanted to have a mother. And she was dead. And I couldn't believe that I didn't have a mother. So after one year, I was not better. I was still sad, not eating, not sleeping, angry without understanding the death. My sister told me, leave the house, go away, I don't want you, you are so, I can't live with you anymore. So I went uh, to the hospital where she died. I wanted to try to find her. Maybe some, somehow she's there, I can touch her spirit. But I couldn't go into the room because they were cleaning it. Somebody else had died. So I said, go to the library. We'll call you after. So I went to the library, it was a Catholic hospital. I picked up the first book I saw, which I liked, the cover, the picture of the cover, and started to read it. It was called The Seven Story Mountain. It was the life of an American monk, Thomas Merton. It was a story how he came from atheism to become a monk. So I started to read. First of all, he was a philosophy teacher. He was a left wing in politics, same as me was uh, the books which you are reading, these books also I read, the films which you saw also, these films I saw, his mother died also, so. every page, just to change the names from America to Australia, it's my life, except, down to the small details, even he, the places he used to go and things he used to do, same, I was amazed, I couldn't put it down, it's like, like someone telling you your life, yeah. can't you, can't so I was amazed. And I kept on reading and reading. I forgot the time. It was an afternoon. Right? I finished till midnight. Till the, everything was closed up. Hospital was shut when I finished the book. At the end of the book, he, he went to a monastery. Yeah. Okay. I didn't believe in God. But I was still atheist, very strong atheist. And now I was in, not only philosophically atheist, but I was also very sad now. Yeah. So I had two two negative forces me. Disbelief and, and sad sorrow. Bo both of which can break faith, right? Can stop faith from growing. So I, had, I was completely in darkness. Darkness of mind and darkness of heart. Then I thought, okay, he found the answer in the monastery. He was the same as me, educated, exactly as me, down to the names of the books even which he read. So I must do like him, go to the monastery. So the next day, okay, with you. The next day, I 
telephone, I opened the telephone book on the monastery and I telephoned the first watch. It was a Roman Catholic monastery. She said, hello, I'd like to come to be a monk. Yeah. He said, uh, okay, which church are you coming from? He said, no, I don't go to church. He said, uh, who is your father? He said, no, I don't have any father. Okay, you don't have, have a confession, but you don't go to church and you want to be a monk, take a rest. I mean, take some time. Close the phone. Okay, let me try another one. The second one was the Serbian Orthodox Monastery. Serbia, you know? Okay, I telephoned. I said, hello, I want to come to be a monk. The bishop was bishop, I didn't know at the time, but he said, okay, come and see. So it was a welcome. Okay, so I went there for Saturday. Who do we pray for on Saturday? In the in the in the Becca. No. In the Oasis, what is it? Departed. Huh? Departed. Departed, right? So it was perfect for me. I arrived on Saturday, they are just praying for the dead. They came from the church and they go to the cemetery. Now Serbian people when they bury their dead, because they always bury their dead next to a monastery. Every Serbian cemetery is next to a monastery. Okay, they make the, the, the grave in the, in the earth with a nice headstone. Next to it, they put a, a bench, a cement or wooden bench. Maybe another one on this side. Every Saturday after the liturgy, they go there and they put food on that table and they sit and they eat. And they talk to the dead person, like like the person is still in the family, still alive. You see? I was amazed. I was sitting with the one couple, man and woman. Their daughter had died in a car crash outside the monastery, and they were very sad. But they doing the same thing and talking to her, Jenny, still in the talking to Jenny as if she's alive. I was really amazed that people can believe like this. So I said, okay, maybe I can somehow talk to my mother like this. Like it was a magic or a seance or something. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. After that, they go to the church to pray to St. Mary. This is what they do every Saturday. You know, Shere Ne Maria in the Tespeha? They have similar, like that, 144 names of St. Mary. <laughs> you are the, the light, you are the tower for the virgins, you are the... In Greek Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, Russian, they have the same prayer. So they go and they pray it in the church in front of the icon of St. Mary. They had a big icon of St. Mary in this church, and it was a famous one I found out because it was uh, wonder working. And one Greek priest, for example, his wife was uh, going for operation of cancer. And the night before, he came to the monastery and he, he said to the monks, I want to pray in front of this icon all night. So one monk stay with him for two hours and then go. Another monk come and stay with him two hours. And go. But all the night he stayed praying for his wife. Next day he went, took her to the hospital. Uh, he said, let us make a last x-ray before the operation. And the surgeon made the x-ray and it's blank. Okay, he says, wrong film. So he put another film, again blank. He said, okay, let's check. Is this the right woman? Check the ID. And he said, well, what can I do? I can't operate. There's nothing there. Then the man told the priest told him, that's right, she's healed. And he told the story that he went to the monastery and prayed to St. Mary. became very known in Australia, this, uh, this story. And other people also. But I didn't know at the time that just I saw this picture of St. Mary. Everybody who came into the church, they made three metania in front of this icon. Okay? Because when you enter Orthodox Church, Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox Church, you must have made three metanias in front of the main icon of the church. Like we do in front of the curtain of the altar. So, I was standing there and I was looking at them. I was thinking, what I'll do? I have to do like this? Because you know what a metania is, right? Okay, you're standing up. This is normal position for a human being, right? Homo erectus. <laughs> <laughs> You don't go down like this. This is like children going down on the ground. You see? And English people, we don't sit down on the ground like this. We sit in chair and uh, sit at table. 
we are civilized people. And you expect me to go like this and put my head down on the ground like this? I was very amazed how I would do it. <laughs> so I went to the icon for at last. Everybody went and started to sing with the priest. The hymn was in Mary. So I was virtually alone in front of the icon. I said, okay, let me do one of this fancy. So I did the first metanya. Touch my head on the floor and stand up. Okay, first one, now two more to go. So I did the second one. And when I bent down, I start to feel small. You know, but you are standing up. You can face the world. And you can look in the eye. And if anybody say anything to you, you can argue. You can fight. But when you are making Britannia, you feel that you are putting yourself in a small position. That you are becoming low, lowly, weak. You know how the fetus is in the womb, right? Almost like a sir. The feet and the, the knees are curved. The fetus is all closed up. Okay? The matanya is like this. It makes you like a baby again. Okay? Your matanya should make you feel weak. Should make you forget that you are a grown up and adult. You are not grown up before God. You will never be grown up before God. You will always be a baby before God. And you need Him. You don't have any independence before God. So, physically, the act of making the metania was a barrier. Like I crashed through a barrier from self-reliance to recognition of need. I was depending on myself and I was not succeeding. When I make the metania, I start to recognize that I need help. So I said, Mary, I didn't know I was supposed to call her Saint Mary or just I said to her Mary. I said, these people, they tell me that you are a mother of God. So, I have a mother. I need a mother, but I haven't got a lost. So I started to talk to Saint Mary like this. It was like a prayer, but I didn't know it was a prayer. Just, I, I was speaking what was in my heart. And even, even I started to cry a little bit, some tears come. And breathe. My breathing was heavier. <laughs> I heard a voice behind my head, back of my head. She said, I will be you. Okay, I, I was kneeling down, right? I did. So I thought maybe one of the serving women saw me crying and came to to comfort me. Okay? So I looked in this way. Not Samaria is here, right? The icon is here. So I looked to the side to see if any Serbian woman was here. Then I looked to the side. Nobody was there. So how was uh, and you know frisson? Frisson means uh, like a like a cold shiver going through you. You feel it maybe if you are frightened or something. I was kneeling down and again she said, second time, I will be your mother. Then I, I knew it must be up here, so I have to look up. I didn't want to look up, I was frightened what I will see. And then I looked up, and she came out, out of the icon. And she stayed in front, in front of me, and she smiled, her eyes shining. She said to me, I will be your mother third time. It was just, I was lost in love. I was looking at her. I was so happy. I never saw anything so beautiful as that in my whole life. All the pain of my, my one year was gone. And I didn't need anything I was feeling. No drugs which I ever took. Nothing make me feel like that. I was so happy. Just I was looking and looking. Even now I can see exactly her face. She was smiling so, such a smile. Then she went back inside and I made the third matan. After that, I just couldn't, couldn't possibly leave that place.
I had to stay there. When they finished the prayer and they went out of the church, I went to the bishop and said, please, I'd like to stay here. He said, okay. So I telephoned to my sister. I said, I'll not come home. She said, oh, <coughs> come tomorrow. He said, no, I'll not come tomorrow. She said, okay, take a week. He said, no, I'll not come anymore. I'm staying here. She was very angry with me. So I started to live there. I wrote a letter to the university. I resigned my job. I told them, you send me the exam papers. I marked them here and send them to you. I couldn't leave her. I just had to stay every day near, near her. Then, after about a month or, or two months nearly, the bishop said to me, you don't know anything. Because every day we go to the church. I don't know what to do in the church. I don't know how to pray. I don't know what is the Bible. I don't know how to take Holy Communion. Nothing. Because I wasn't Christian, right? I didn't believe in God at all. Even Jesus, I didn't consider him uh, divine or anything. Just I, I had such a love which I never had before in my life. And I used to go every day and kiss him many a thousand times in the day. He said to me, I want you to go to Europe to see the old ancient monasteries, to see orthodoxy in the Euro European way. He said, yeah, okay, I'll go. So he sent me to Serbian fathers. Serbian monks in Serbia. I stayed with it. it. was war then. There was a war. You know, in the early 90s, there was a war between the Serbs and the <coughs> Croats. The Serbs are Orthodox and the Croats are Catholic. And then the Albanian Muslims joined the war as well. So it was three, three, three sided war. Everybody against the Serbs. The NATO against the Serbs. Serbian Orthodox, they were by themselves. They had a little bit of help from Russia and a little bit from Greece, though much. And some terrible things happened in that war, which I which I'll tell you after before I finish. I, I was in the middle of the war and I wasn't happy. I didn't go there to be in a war. I went there to, to learn orthodoxy. I hadn't made any progress at all. So I went to the monastery where I was supposed to be staying and painted on, on the wall on this side is Jesus, and painted on this side is St. Mary, as you go in the, the gate of the monastery. I was standing there looking at them, there was some writing. I didn't know what the writing was, because it was in the support. Somebody came and I was asking, what is the writing? The writing was like this, they told me what is the writing. St. Mary says to Jesus, my son, forgive them. Jesus says, no, I'll not forgive And the second time, Samaria says, my son, forgive them. Jesus says, no, they have hard hearts, I'll not forgive them. And the third time, Samaria says, my son, for my sake, forgive them. And Jesus says, for your sake, I'll forgive them. When I heard this interpretation, I was amazed. Because I thought that she was uh, everything. Why she need to ask him? This is the crucified one. She is so glorious and so beautiful. Why she need to ask any help from anybody? Maybe surely she is the most the saving one. She saved me. Why she can't save everybody? So I was surprised that Samaria have to ask Jesus something. So this start, start something to make me think, yeah? something in my mind. Then I went to Greece. I ran away from the war and went to Greece. Went to Mount Athos. You heard of Mount Athos? Okay, I went there. I went with some Macedonian boys who were running away from the war. So. And they were going to the Serbian monastery in Mount Athos. But it's very far, the Serbian monastery. Very high in the, in the far in the hill mountain. The Greek monasteries are near the sea, so they are much easier to get. So I went to the Greek monastery, the first one which I very nice one. Philothe means love of God. I went into the monastery and I said to the Macedonian boys before we went inside, I said to them, You you go, I I'll, I'll ask if I can stay here. 
because I wanted to go to the Sefer Monastery straight away. So I went in, it was evening prayer, and the icon of St. Mary, every, every monastery in Madrasas has a big icon of St. Mary, which is, uh, which is uh, special for that monastery. Like, there's another monastery where I stayed, and the St. Mary icon in that monastery is called Portaitisa, that means gatekeeper. You know, it's like the story of John Carmen. She did the same thing with him in Syria. She was, one night a man, a poor man, he came, he was a pilgrim and he came to that monastery. This was about in 17th century. He came to that monastery and he was from wood, chopping wood in the forest. He said to the monk on the gate, I, I like to sleep here. Can you give me some bread and I sleep tonight? The monk said, no, you are, you are bigger, go. We are close. And the man said, please, I don't have any food and I don't have anywhere to go. He said, no, you are just a beggar. And the monk put him out. So he went for a walk in the forest somewhere and then he fell down and he said, what can I do? And then he looked up and he saw a beautiful lady standing there. She said to him, why are you sad? He said, because you called me a beggar. She said, okay, you wait. After a few minutes she came back. She said to him, here. She gave him some money. She said, now you go and give the money to him and tell him you come to buy your food and to pay for your sleep. Okay, he was very happy, thank her and he went. He went to the monastery. The monk was very angry to see him again. He said, no, I'm not a beggar. And he said, here's the money to pay for my food. Now, in Greece, you know, when they have icon of St. Mary, they put some chains around her neck. If you give any money to the monastery, they make a hole in it, in the middle, and they put it on the necklace, they thread it on the necklace. So in every monastery you will find a chain with many coins on it. So when the monk took these coins, he looked at it, and he can see the hole in the coins, which is the hole that the monastery makes to put it on the chain. He went to the church and he looked, and three are missing three coins from the, their place miss empty. And these are the three coins which St. Mary gave to him. He said, where you get these coins? He said, the lady met me in the forest and she gave me her money. She said, this is my money, you go and pay for it. So the monk was, treat him like a king and take him in. And so every monastery in was like this having many stories about the glorious protection of St. Mary for them. So this night when I arrived there, I went into the church, it was Vespers, everybody was in the church there praying. The sun was coming through the window. And it was hitting the icon. This icon in this monastery, St. Mary is holding baby Jesus, and baby Jesus put his hand on her cheek and kissed her. Maybe you have seen it. It's called Plikut. Plikut is the sweetly kissing one. So it's very famous, I call In French, you call it tenderness. tenderness. I don't know what they call it in English. It's like sweetly kissing one. Just he put his hand, even he hardly touched her, but a little bit, and then he put up his mouth to kiss her. Very tender. So I... And the sun was shining and was hitting this uh, icon and she was shining in gold and so much. So I met him at Tanya and I said, Mom, I need, I need a place to stay. I, I can't go anymore. Can you help? Can you arrange for me to stay here? Maybe I can stay with you in this place. He's always talking to her. Sometimes like a daughter, sometimes like a mother, sometimes like a wife. And any, whatever I need, just I talk to her as I need her. So, I didn't finish the, the words which I was saying to her. I was still talking. And then a monk came and he tapped me on the shoulder and said, come. He took me to the, to the abbot, to the rais there. And he said to me, go with father. Tomorrow we will give you the clothes, but tonight you will sleep in your cell for the first time. I didn't ask. You understand? I, I asked him, Mary fix it for me, but before even I finished, 
They said for me and tell me you can stay here. So she told him straight away, go and take my take take this one. Look after him. I want to jump a lot now to tell you something from here, from this one. How she how she can protect you physically. I'll come back to the story. One night I was going in the mountain here. I go from my cave to the cave of St. Anthony to pray the Mass at midnight. Because you know midnight, this is the beginning of the new day. So we pray at midnight in the cave of St. Anthony because there's no people there. And the way I have to go, I don't come all the way down to the monastery and go all the way up on the steps. So I go across the top of the mountain because my cave is halfway between the church of St. Paul and the cave of St. Anthony. But on another mountain on this side. So to get there, for 40 minutes I have to walk from my cave, go up and then go along. And the path which goes along the mountain is made by, by gazelle, by deer. So it's very narrow because they don't need a wide one. They can walk on a very narrow path. But me, I need more. Anyway, I manage. But this night, it will, you know, two weeks in the month there is moon and two weeks there is no moon. When there's no moon, it's very dark because there's not much light here, no city. Like it's really black. So I was walking on this path and my foot, uh, I didn't see clearly to put my foot in the right place and they slipped. And I start to fall. And it's a long, you saw when you climbed up, did you see? It's a long, long slope to go right down. So I start to roll over and over. I thought I will hit my head and die. I will, I will die now. But I was going to the mass, not coming home. So I said, no, I want to take all of So I said, mom, I didn't say mom, I didn't, I said mom, I didn't finish the word. Suddenly I felt like, like something, pressure on me and I stopped falling. There are no rocks there. It's just, it's just earth and it sloped like that. And I stopped. I feel this tight pressure around me like this. I start to catch my breath. When I, when I, when I was sitting there, finally when I can breathe, I felt the, the pressure release. So you see, she catch me and hold me until I can stop falling. She would not, not let me to die. I could have died. Other people died in the mountain. American visitors. Uh, novice. Three people. In the last five years, three people have died in the mountain from falling. But not me. You see? Because she would not let me die. She would protect me. Even to the point of catching me. Hold me. So... She told to that father to accept me. And I stayed there with her for one year in the monastery. Now Greeks, they are very hard, not like you. And the Egyptian people, they are very, very welcoming and kind, especially to foreigners. But Greek people, they think that if you are not Greek, okay, that's your misfortune, but <laughs> So, especially monks, if you are not Greek Orthodox, something wrong with you. Certainly you are not going to be saved. They are a bit tough like that. So there I was, in living and I didn't speak Greek. I was trying to learn a bit, but I couldn't speak at all. So after about nine or ten months, I was very sad. I got isolated. Because I wasn't, you know why I was there? I wasn't Christian. I didn't believe in God. I didn't believe in Jesus. Only I, I knew that St. Mary was my beloved, my mother, my everything. And I knew that if I need her, she would come to me and she would help me. But that's all I knew. It was existential. You know, existential. Existential means pertaining to existence, not to essence. So I had no faith. I had only experience of her. 
what I knew, I knew her because she came to me. But that's it. So I had nothing to support me except her. No faith. I wasn't a monk for believing in monk life. No. So I stayed there. After nine months, I became very sad. And there was one father. You know, they say in Mount Athasta, when you go to live in the desert alone, solitary, either you become a saint or you become crazy. And this is true. And I was working in the kitchen. And this crazy monk, he used to come from the forest and sit in the, in the kitchen to take food to eat. And when he finished something, he threw it at me. <laughs> <laughs> and he, the carrot, if you not eat all the carrot, okay, he threw it at me. So all day I'm sitting there back. <laughs> I can't say anything because he's a big father and I'm novice. So, and uh, when they make the, the wood, somebody has to go down into the into the pit where they keep the wood and put it in a in a in a, in a basket and they will pull it up. They are all upstairs in the kitchen with a hole in the floor, and me, I'm in the pit. Everything was hard for me there. Okay, if I was a Christian boy, an Orthodox boy, wanting to be monk, and it, I would be uh, happy enough. But I was still foreign, still me, my professor, philosophy, and, still, and I'm working in the dirt and putting the things in the basket. Very sad. So, after about nine months, I became very, very lonely and very sad. The church of this side of the valley and the monk cells on this side, they have a bridge. You have to go across the bridge to go from to your cell in the evening. You are allowed to walk on the bridge at night for half an hour at the sunset. But this night, don't be shocked. So this night I was standing there on the bridge looking down. It was a very deep valley. And I was thinking, suppose, suppose I, if I lean too far, I will fall down. You can call it suicide wish. Death wish. Just I was, I didn't say to myself, I'm going to throw myself down, I'm going to commit suicide and write a note, goodbye, Father. Just I was, at that moment, I was standing there, it was very far, and I was fascinated by the darkness. Maybe I can sleep. I don't know. Just I was thinking almost to fall. So it was sunset, right? The sun, the light comes from, from up. But this light starts to come from down. It was pink, like, like this uh, top. It was pink. It started to come up. So the sun was coming down and this light was coming up. It was very small like this. Then as it came up, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And as it became bigger, it started to take the shape of boom, like a doll. It came up and up and up. As it came higher and higher, it was getting bigger from girl to a woman, and then it was standing in front of me. Have you seen the photos of Zaitun, Samarian Zaitun? Mm -hmm. yes. At that time I didn't know about it, of course, but it was the same like that. You see how in Zaitun she's, she appeared not in a flesh form, but in light. You see? At the, but there it was, I think, white light. The photograph which I've seen is white light. But what I, when she came to me in Mount it was in pink light. She came up and she was standing opposite me in the air. I'm standing on the bridge and she's standing there but with her back to me. Huh? So I can see this pink, pink light in the whole woman form but with her veil on. Then I was so happy. I, I thought that she'd come again to after from Australia. I didn't see her. Now she'd come. And then she turned around like this. And when she turned around, she took off the veil for, for a short moment to look at me and smile at me. Then she put it again and she went off into the sky. And then she became part of the sunlight which was sitting. It was enough. The first smile cured me and the second smile comforted me. You know? So, I was, I was, it was okay. I can live there forever. I was not sad anymore. Next day I went to the kitchen and just he can throw everything at me. <laughs> After uh, one and a half years, I left. 
I said I should go back to my Serbian bishop in Australia. So I went to the to go on the boat because you have to leave Mount Athos by boat. Now, when you come to the boat, the boat it, it parks near the near the jetty, you know. So you have to walk. You are standing here from the customs house, and you stand here. And there's a little bridge, okay, to go onto the boat. <coughs> so I'm standing here. I have my bag, everything. And the boat is here, and the captain on the boat is standing there, saying, "Come on." My feet won't move. I want to lift up this foot and put it, but it won't come. Nothing wrong with me, okay? I'm in good health. He said to me, "Come on." I said to him, I want to come, but my feet, I can't hold my feet. He swear at me in Greek. I'm wanting to lift up my feet. He said, come on. He said, I, ca I can't. He said, okay. And he took the bridge and he went. As soon as he lift up the bridge, my feet can go. Okay. I said, what is this? So I went back to the... To the, to the cell, the monastery, to stay one more night. I go tomorrow. In the cell, what I found there, my icon. I didn't take it with me. Of course, it was a very nice icon of St. Mary, but an old one. And I thought that if I took it, they will uh, tell me you are taking uh, uh, ancient works of art from the monastery. If it was a modern one, they wouldn't have said, but because it was a painted one, they would maybe say, I'm taking a for, uh, 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 artifacts and uh, ancient. Uh, but I said, okay, mom, she not let me to, to go away without her. She must have come with me. So I put it in my bag. Tomorrow, straight to the hospital. Never. She allowed me to go one step without her. And I went back to Australia and I went to my Serbian bishop and said, okay, I, and I make Matanya to him and I behave like Orthodox because I learned in Greece. And he was very happy. He thought I was yeah, really Orthodox. So he said, okay, I mean, very good, come. And he made me a monk and I'm living in the monastery as a monk. Before that I was just a novice. Ah. But I didn't believe in God didn't believe in Jesus. You understand? After two and a half years, I'm still son of St. Mary only. So, I'm living there. I'm happy enough because she is in my heart. But Then the Serbs, they like to hunt. So they went. In Australia, there's many rabbits. You know, it's like a pest. A pest. A plague of pest. So they like to go into the fields and to shoot the rabbits. So they go for a picnic, they make a whole day. All of them, the, the bishop and the priest and the deacon and all the people, they go into the countryside and they shoot rabbits and cook them and eat them. Now, I was vegetarian for 20 years, so I, I refused, point blank, to have anything to do with this. <laughs> so they said, okay, you stay and look after the monastery and we'll go. I said, okay, this is a good deal. So I was staying there in the monastery. It's very calm, very peaceful. Three Egyptians came to visit, two girls and one boy. The monastery I told you, the icon of Samaria is very famous in Australia, so many people like to come. And the Serbs, they make beautiful churches. They have very nice churches. When you go home, you go and see a Serbian church. It's so beautiful. The architecture, perfect. The domes, the proportion is perfect. So, many people came to visit this monastery. <coughs> So these three Coptic Egyptian young people came like you, two girls and one boy. The older girl and the boy were engaged, and the younger girl, she was with them. So they left her with me. They went for a walk because of nice woods outside the monastery. They went for a walk to talk about their wedding. And they left the girl with me. Okay. Sitting there with her. What did I do with her? I don't know. She said to me, Abuna, you like to read the Holy Bible? I never read the Bible. I don't know what is in the Bible. Okay. 
I have to do something with her, so let's read the Bible. So she took out her Bible. Fat Bible words. But every page is red and black because of the black printing, and she has written in red thousands of notes. And if I'm, I don't know, Sunday school or what, half of the Bible is black and half is red. So she opened the Bible and she started to tell me from Genesis. She got all through the Bible, she told me, Does God make an agreement with Abraham and he can do this? God make an agreement with Moses and he do this? She explained to me the covenant, what is the idea of covenant. I never thought about it before. Uh, what is the idea of the prophet? That, uh, what are the role of the prophets? The people turn away from God and the prophets call them back. For two hours she was telling me the history of the God's covenant with people. From Old Testament to New Testament to Apocalypse and to Revelation. I was just amazed. Yeah. She was about 16. Sitting there, a small girl like this. You know, some Egyptian girls are very small. And I was. <laughs> <laughs> so I was amazed. And I'm supposed to be the father looking after the, the little one. She's telling me, Abuna, look at this. And this. She forgot me. And she's busy explaining the whole Bible. And I'm just looking amazed. Then the others came and took her away. Afterwards, I was wanting to know more about this. I was thinking about it. I start. What Samiri, I heard about Samiri in the Serbian monastery telling to Jesus to forgive the people. It starts to make some sense now because I thought about what, what this girl told me. So I called her by the telephone. I said, I'd like to come and talk about the Bible more. She said, Welcome, woman. So I went to her house. And I was sitting there waiting for her to explain the Bible. She said, Abuna, we have to pray first waiting for me to pray. I don't know how to pray. <laughs> so she said, Abun, you have to make the pain alive. She questioned and she taught me how to pray and he say, say our Father and tell Jesus what you in your heart and then close and then we'll read the Bible. After the read the Bible again we make a prayer. So she was making me Christian. I went there every week or two weeks or three months. Many times I asked her things, many times she told me a new story. Finally, she, I, I start to accept that there is some, something especially good in Christianity, something especially wonderful in, in what Jesus taught in his life. But still I was without any focus, I didn't have any way to put it into practice. Then one day she looked at me and she said, Abuna, you are not happy in your monastery. I said, you mean to be in your monastery? She said, no. She said, why don't you go to the desert, to Ambatonis? I said, who is Ambatonis? Okay. It was the wedding of the other two, her friends, the next, next week. She said, come to me next week for the wedding. So I came there. They had the wedding. The bishop said to me, you can go, but don't dance and go into the party. Be a little bit uh, calm. So after the church, she said to me, don't come with me. She put the chairs like this, in a half circle by the, this is the corner of the room. She put the chairs like this. And the uh, Egyptian mothers come and sit in the chair. They are big. <laughs> they make like a wall <laughs> like a wall in the chairs and she took me behind and sit me on the floor and she had photo books from all of the monasteries from Antonia's, from Angola from Bishoy, uh, from Mahar and she sit me down and she started to tell me Senexari, Ustan Rahaban she started to tell me who is Antonia's, who is Angola the life of them by illustrating by the books of the monasteries, the photo of the monasteries. She told me what is the life of the desert de fathers, which song you sing in the beginning. She said like that. She 16 or something? I think 16 at the time. So, she was explaining me everything about the desert. 
was so happy. I mean, this was really something which I, I was overwhelmed by this. I was taken by this. St. Anthony, how he lived in the mountains. He showed me the picture of the cave in the book and everything. And from the Bustan, you know, there are many stories. In the Bustan, there's first of all Life of St. Anthony by Athanasius, then one or two longer passages, and then all the short uh, sayings. Right? And she tell me many of these by illustrating by the, the monastery books. Oh, I was really interested in this, do like this. She said, I want to make a deal. I said, oh, okay. She said, you go to Amatonis, and me, I go to City of the Camp. I said, okay, we'll do it together. So, I said, help. She said, don't worry, Pope is coming. Pope Shunura, he was coming to Australia to open the monastery of St. Anthony in Melbourne. There's two monasteries, one in Sydney, one in Melbourne. So he came there. She said, don't. I, I said to her, shall I make an appointment? She said, try. So when I telephoned the priest, I said, hello, I'd like to make an appointment with Pope Shunura. She said, who are you? I said, my name is so-and-so, I'm -and professor of philosophy at the New University. Well, we don't know the itinerary exactly. Mm -hmm. Call me tomorrow. Call tomorrow. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, no. He wouldn't give me an appointment. Many times I tried. But now I know that a priest cannot make an appointment for the popes. <laughs> uh, I said, it's not possible. Hell, I can see that book. She said, don't worry. God will arrange. Always she said, it's God will arrange. So, when Pope Sula came from the church, everybody is standing there. Usually she holds my hand to take me here and there because I don't know anything. <laughs> Pope came from the church and going to eat in the next place. Suddenly there is no living, where is she? I feel lost. Then Pope is coming. I have to make some. I feel somebody behind me. First, push me. And Pope. He's coming this way, so he can see her and he can see me. And she pushed me like this. So I'm falling onto the pole. <laughs> and I put my hand onto his hand. To st I don't want to fall on him. <laughs> I have to stop myself. Oh, when I put my hand onto his elbow, you think World War Three? Eh? All of the bishops and all of the boys. <laughs> <laughs> they are just waiting for this. The, the deacons, they are just waiting for a chance to beat somebody up. <laughs> they are talking to be bodyguard for the Pope and they are really happy about it. And foreign, not, not even Egyptian, so you can give it him. So then, the Pope, he tell them, be quiet. Calm down. He said to me, what do you want? He said to him, uh, I, I, I would like to come to Egypt to be in the desert monastery. He said to me, but if you have the love of God in your heart, you can be happy anyway. I said, but this love of God, I don't have it now, here. I want to come to Egypt to minister this. this. He looked at me, you know, sometimes he can open, not now, I don't know, he's really old, but before, he can open his eyes and like it, boring into you, and like he's looking straight into your heart. So he looked at me like this. I felt a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> but after, after a few seconds, I don't know how long it was, a few seconds. Then he, said, then he stopped and his eyes became normal size and he said, Welcome. Smile. So I think somehow in that moment he, because he did it again before he made me a priest. When I was going to Paris to serve there, I went for six months there. Yeah. I was going to go as a monk, so he called me. And he looked at me like this and opened his eyes and <laughs> and when he bore inside me, maybe Holy Spirit tell him yes you can ordain him or what. Then he'll calm down and he tell me yes tomorrow I'll ordain you and you go to Paris to be. So both in Australia and here he he made this judgment by maybe he learnt it as when he became patriarch of the To make a decision. So he often has to make a decision about somebody. So maybe he prays at that moment in a psychological way to, to examine the person. 
Anyway, he said, well, then I stood back and he passed by. Then the bean came out and she said, what do you say? He said, well, he said, okay, nobody can say anything to you. Now the folks are welcome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she discussed with me the arrangements we would do. And, and I took the airplane and came to Egypt. Sad part of the story is that when she tried to go to St. Germana, her confession father, he told her, no, you have to get married. So she could be a nun, but that is not concerned us exactly now. <coughs> so I arrived in Egypt, two o'clock in the morning. I had a letter from Father Isaac in London, who was at that time serving in the monastery in Australia. Now he's come back here. So he took me to see him. I stayed with him for about a week. He taught me to read Coptic so that I can attend the test for And he gave me a note for Ramba Yohannes to say that this is an Australian man who wanted to come on. So I knew I had to go to the Abbasia, to the Cathedral, and give this letter to somebody called Ramba Yohannes. This is what I knew. So at 2 o'clock in the morning, okay, I went to the hotel. I slept a few hours. 7, 7.30 I went to the Abbasia and up on the door. One priest opened the door a little bit, like well done, <laughs> a little bit. He said, what do you want? He said, uh, I want to see the Pope. I come to want to be a monk in the desert. Have a letter. So I gave the letter to close the door. So I'm waiting. Like some people, I'm waiting. And the door not opening. Okay, I back again. Open the door. What do you want? He said, I want to be a monk and to go see the Pope and to... So okay, come in took me into the waiting room. I don't know, it's got blue wallpaper. I can, even I can tell you the design of the wallpaper. <laughs> <laughs> he put me there. 7.40, right? 9 o'clock in the evening, I still there. The whole day, from 7.40 till 9 in the evening, I was staying in this blue paper, wallpaper. <laughs> Many people come, stay half an hour and go. See the Pope and go, me, no. just sit there. There was one boy, he gave me Coca Cola. <laughs> <laughs> nothing to eat, no food. But there was a, there was a, a crate of Coke in bottles outside. I finished. <laughs> <laughs> but I was getting angry and the whole day, just waiting and waiting. And other people are obviously seeing the Pope because they are coming, even foreigners. One man was making a film on the life of uh, the saints and uh, Egyptian saints. Another man was doing interview about uh, Pontius Pilate. Does the Coptic Church consider him a saint or not? In Ethiopian Sinaxarium, he's a saint. He was afterwards converted. But I remember the whole day it was just passing. I was waiting. Finally, in the evening, I thought, what is this? It's not the way to go on to treat somebody like this. So I went into his office. All day I'd been frightened from going into the office. So I just went in and I said, what is this? And he, I'm waiting all day. <laughs> he said, what do you want? I said, what do I want? He said, I gave you the letter. I told you I, I want to see the Pope to make an interview because I want to be a monk in the desert. He said, no, 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 you can't see the Pope. He's uh, preaching in the church. It was Wednesday, right? He said, I, I came to 7 30 this morning. I'm waiting. And I start to abuse him yeah, because I was so angry. He said, okay, wait. So he went out. I stayed in his office. I didn't go back to the blue room. I could never go to the blue room. <laughs> <laughs> he went out. He came back after some time. He said, uh, I gave you a letter to Ambayanis. You have to go to the wedding retreat to San Michel Ministry. He said, how I have to go? He said, okay, Pope will go in his car. You can go in the other car. That is the baggage car. Okay. After the Pope finished, 9.30. Those days he used to go on Wednesday night. Now I think he goes on Friday. But. So, we went to the Natron with the siren and the police. It was very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> when we arrived there, 11 o'clock, the Pope came down from his car. Everybody kissed his hand and he'd go into his house and close the door. Okay, I'm standing there. What do we do now? <laughs> Nothing. Everybody goes to his cell. I'm standing there in the dark next to the Pope's car. 
there's a yeah, I'm here and name, everybody laughing, what, what I'll do. So Palangelos, he was now in Ambangelos in England. Him and uh, Ambassador, they were the, the two priests in charge of the Makar at that time. I'm going to make this, you're making me as an ah at that time. So, I'm going to get us to me, I can give you a, a room. So he gave me a room. He said, you can come to eat tomorrow, 9 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Okay, we started like that. A few days going by, I thought something will happen soon. And a few more days, a few more weeks. Six weeks I was waiting. Okay, six weeks I was staying in the house. Every day I go to the monastery, attend the Sveha, attend the Mass, come back. Uh, not take Holy Communion because far, don't give him Holy Communion. Not all the doctors. Only I spent two years in my doctors, but not long. <laughs> so, I come back to the Pope's house and wait. And every week the Pope comes and he sees the children and smile on them and kiss them and uh, sit with the mothers and the fathers and the bishops and the priests and everybody. Me, no. Nothing. <laughs> Maybe he gave me his hand to kiss in the evening and he arrived. Okay, but that's it. For six weeks, uh, I mean, where are you? I just, I'm crazy. And I had enough. Okay? I really, I had enough. <coughs> One day I saw him, after the six weeks, I saw him sitting outside, writing for a Watan. He likes to write everything by himself, you know, by his hand. So I was sitting there, nobody, when he's writing like this, you don't approach him, and you leave him in peace. This is a rule of the Mahar. Ah, okay. <laughs> You're for it. I came there, I went straight to him. No, Matanya. No kiss his hand. No, Your Holiness. Nothing. You. <laughs> I said, you didn't speak to me for six weeks. Look up at me. Very surprised. Uh, what is a peace to you? Welcome, Father. Come, Father. I'm still busy. Okay, we all start this. When you're going to finish? Uh, later. 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 Six weeks. Six weeks. So, eh. But I spoke to you. You. So, I told him. That gentleman was. She is an Orthodox from Macedonia. Ah. Macedonia? Ah. Madame Lazarus. Welcome. Right. Madame Anastasi. And she is happy to be here. Ah, right. We are coming from North America mm -hmm. to visit the monastery. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 The half of Macedonia is Greece and half of Syria. Okay. I said to the Pope, uh, you, you haven't spoken to me for six weeks and I'm waiting. He looked at me, he was very surprised, he said, I'm sorry I didn't speak to you about the love of God. What did he say to me in Australia? If you have the love of God in your heart, you can be happy anyway. Ah, catch 22. Exactly the same phrase, right? He said, I'm sorry I didn't speak about the love of God. He knew what he was doing. What does he do in the Bustain? In the Bustain, if you want to be a monk, what do you do? You go to the Father and you sit by his cell and you tell him, Father, accept me, I want to be a disciple. And maybe the Father will kick you or maybe he will close the door, but he will test you somehow, right? You have to wait to prove that you are serious. The Pope was testing me if I'm patient. Huh? Because he, he remembered exactly the same phrase which he said. In Australia he said again that, that day. But I wasn't smart to pick up this. I was clouded by anger. My mind was not clear. He said to me, ah, I don't want your God, I don't want your... Uh, use him. And then I left. I said, I'm going. And I left. He was just looking very sad. So I took a bus and I came to Cairo. Very angry, right? Sitting in the hotel room. What shall I do? Start to calm down a bit. Okay, no money. Because I, the money I had, which I bought the ticket, that was it, the last money I had. 
Don't know anybody. No, no friend at all I can go to. Don't speak Arabic any, any word. So, I'm in a real bad position. What you can do? So, can you ask my mom? I opened the Bible, which Nabin gave me. Inside was a photograph of Samaria Zaitun. How she appeared on the church, it said. It's a little photograph. Uh, just she's like a fairy. She's in, uh, in light. You can see her body, but and her thin face, but just in, in light. So I looked at the photo for a long time, I turned it over, and she wrote here, this is St. Mary, as she appeared in Zaita. Okay, let me go and ask her what I do. So I went to Zaita, I went into the church, big church. Nothing. She's not there. I said, but this is St. Mary's church. Where is she? I went outside, I said to somebody in the street, this is the church of St. Mary? She said, yes. I said, she appeared here? I said, no, she appeared in the little church on the other side of the road. Okay. I went to the other church. I went inside. There were some children there singing. After a few minutes, they left with their teacher. So I was alone in the church. I looked around, and I saw near the door the same the same picture which Naveen gave me, it was on the wall, life size. Underneath was a sand pit and some candles. Not many, three or four candles. I looked at them. So I thought, okay, let me ask. So I made the first matanya. Nothing. Then I made a second matanya. And I told her, look, mom, what I do? I, I did this and this. And I confessed to her what I did. I spoke to both like this. I was waiting. She said to me, stay with me. I was prepared to hear something. And I heard a voice, stay with me. So I looked up. And the light, it wasn't from the candles. Because the candles were down. The light was coming from her, from her face. Like, like when you turn on your torch, you can see the beam of light. It was like that. Just I can see the light coming onto me. Just covering me to my shoulders. She said, stay with me. And it was so, I was looking at her, one, waiting for her to smile, but the light was too strong and I have to bend my bend down. Then the light stopped. So I started to think, stay with me, what do I do? I can't stay in the church. What does it mean? It means stay with me in, uh, in Egypt way, because in, only in Egypt she appeared like this. It's not from Lourdes, it's not from uh, Medjugorje, it's not from, it's only in Egypt. Okay. So I said, okay, let me stay with her. So how to stay with her? I have to ask the Pope to go back to the Pope. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I went back to Arena Trun, but the taxi driver was a Muslim. <coughs> I wouldn't go, he wouldn't go into the monastery. So he dropped me at the corner when the road turns to go into the monastery. There's one kilometer straight road. You come on this way and then you turn the corner and you go this way. There's a farm here. So he stopped there, he said, you go. Okay, I got out and I walked. So it was one kilometer to the monastery and another kilometer to the house of the Pope. So every step, when I was walking, every step I said, now open the door. All the way. When I arrived there, the boy he knew me, so he opened the gate. There was option. It could have been anywhere, right? It could have been Cairo, it could have been Alexandria, it could have been out of the country. But there he was, standing there, and some people with him, bishops. I went straight there, and I didn't make a small matanya, I make a big matanya, you know, like to make like a cross. <laughs> so, he looked at me like this. He didn't say anything. Just he put his hands under my shoulders because I was laying flat down there. Under my shoulders. He lifted me up. I stand up. And then he put his arms around me. And he said, welcome. Again. Saying what he said in his job. Then he gave me to a woman. Going to this. 
from the same self and staying there again. Okay, this time I was patient. Huh? Five months. Five months I stayed there in that room. Nothing. One night after five months, and a book coming all the time and going. After five months, one night Father Gilas came to my cell and said, In the morning, you will be cooked tomorrow. Seven o'clock. Okay. He said, Come half past six, and Pope will put uh, my room, because I was already baptized with the dogs. Then he will go to the church and he will become monk. So I became a Coptic monk that day. And he said to me, What name you take? You can choose three. And I choose one from the three. So I told him, What about Longinus? You know, Longinus, who was the soldier who put the spear in the side of Jesus. Because I was remembering all of the times which I spoke about, bad about him before must be wounding him very much. No, there was already a Buna Longina somebody to show it, so I can't take it. In any monastery, only one monk can have one name. You have to have a different name. Then I said, what about John Cassian? Because he was a foreigner, and he came to Egypt, and he stayed in the desert. No, Pope didn't like him, because he's not an Egyptian. <laughs> 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 then I said, okay, what about Lazarus? I said, why? I said, well, it was four days in the tomb, right? And I was nearly 40 when I, when I came to the monastery. So 10 years equal to one day. I was dead, like dead in my soul. Ah, he said, this is a very good, uh, very good meaning. I can make me Father Lazarus. He didn't say, in the church, he didn't say, Father Lazarus, I'm not sure. I was made a monk with another boy, Eritrean boy. He was called Mishimi and I'm not sure. But when he resembled me, when he made me monk, he said, Father Lazarus, why? He should have called me Lazarus Amba Vishoy. Yeah. Because the monk is known by the name of his monastery. But where are we now? Antonis. Maybe he didn't know, but maybe something tell him not to say that. Huh? So that I can come here with no I'm not attached to it. I'm not Amba Vishoya, I'm Amba. Nothing. Now I'm Lazarus Sir Antoni, but not by any, not by any, uh, by Pope, only Father Lazarus. So, so it was easy for me to change the monastery, otherwise, very difficult. So I became a Coptic monk, then I can take Holy Communion, finally. And at that time, the teaching of Nabin started to, to work in me with the Holy Communion. They start to grow, to become serious Christian person. Then, after just a short time, maybe two weeks or three weeks, I was working in the library there. Some Indian visitors came, priests. Because the Pope Shunga, he knows the head of the Indian Orthodox Church. Sometimes he accepts visitors from there to learn Coptic. These two priests, they wanted to see all the monasteries of the desert. So I said, oh, can I go with them? Pope said, okay. So we went to visit all the monasteries. The last two we came here on the and Lord. When we came here, we came in the gate and we parked over here to go into the into the guest house over there. Not you are in the one up there, but in those days they have one over here. So the Indian priest and maybe said, No, we don't want to go to the guest house. We want to go straight to the cave and then we'll come down and in the evening because it was afternoon and we'll sit in the evening in the guest house. So we went straight to the cave. You went there, right? This one? Okay. We went into the cave. The two of them, because they are priests, they go first and they make matanya. And they kiss the altar and make a prayer. And they went back. I thought they are standing at the back of the cave. Okay? And then I went and I made my matanya. One. And I made two. And I thought, okay, let me tell now what I've got to tell you. And I start to tell him, I'm Antonius, you are... Everything what Nevin told me, I told him. You are father of monks and a star in the desert, and this and this. So then, usually I ask mom if I need something, but in this case I need something from monks, so I better ask you, you are father of monks. I haven't a place. Pope Shinoda, he keep me in his house. 
You know, allow me to go to under the monastery. I want to be a monk. I don't want to stay in the book house forever. So I was complaining like this, telling him, can't you find me a place and here? Like this. And I was making Matanya again, right? He told me, my Nushiri. Stick in my brain this word, my Nushiri. And I make another Matanya quickly, I ask him, tell me again, tell my Nushiri. Twice he told me this word. I don't understand it, okay, but I remember. I thought maybe it was the Indian priests speaking in their language, but they are gone out. So, okay, I accept this from Ahmad Then I kissed the altar and we went down. I asked the priest here, Father Jesus, what is the meaning of my machine? You know? And the Tazbeha said, when you finish the other Antonius, be my machine. Abba Bishoy, be my machine. This means the one who loves his disciples. The one who loves Shiri in Coptic means son. The one who loves his sons. Ah, this means that if he tell me my Shiri, that means he loves me as his son, as his disciple. Mahaputal means. So I took it straight as a as a blessing. So we went back to the we met Ambiostos and the monks and we talked. We stayed a few days, then we went back to, we went to Ambabola and then we went back to, I to, to the I said to the Pope, I want to go to Mount Antonius to stay there, but there's no, you are a foreigner, you cannot live with Egyptians, stay here. Okay, I thought this needs some strong prayer. So I took the egg beer, I still have it in my kit. I opened this egg beer, I pasted one picture of Pope Shnuda on this side and a cupboard. Pope Shnuda, very frowning like this, with his eyes very like a savage mood. Another picture of him on the other side, smiling. <laughs> so every night when I went to the to the chair, I said, "Okay, Lord, change the face from this to this." <laughs> For about six months, I make this magic prayer. Then it was Palm Sunday. Right? Pope Shirley is going to preach in the, to pray the, the liturgy in the St. Bishop Church. Thousands of people will be there. So said, what can I do? I can't see him. After the liturgy, just I, I walk slowly back to the Makar, not, not worry about anything. Then I open the gate and there he is, alone, with Amba Ioannis, but two of them. <coughs> and he's just standing there, not in a hurry, not to. I was amazed. I went straight to him, I made a small Natanya, I said, Your Holiness, please, can I go to Amma Thomas for Holy Week? Mm. He looked at me, he looked at Amba Johannes, he said, Are you going to St. Paul's? Because Amba Johannes from St. Paul's. He said, Yes, if you give me your blessing. The Pope said, Okay, you take Father Lazarus and throw him in Amba Thomas. <laughs> Literally like that, he said, Throw him in Amba Ah, I was sad. So, in the evening, I went with Ambayanis to St. Paul. We stayed there Sunday night and Monday morning. First day of Holy Week, he brought me here in the morning for the 10 o'clock uh, session. Took me into the church, Ambayanis accepted me and uh, Ambayanis left and I stayed here. All of Holy Week. My first week in this monastery was Holy Week. So happy. I was really in the second heaven. Listening to the thought taking home and all that. After Holy Week, uh, Easter, then I stayed in my cell and I didn't come out. <laughs> After three days, Mumbai Yostas called me. What are you doing here? You're supposed to go. After Holy Week, you're supposed to go. I said, ah, I want to live in a cave in the mountain. Because Naveen told me all about this, this life. Not monastery, she told me about the desert, the solitary life. So he said, okay, but you are not my son. You come from Pope, you have to go to Pope to get the place. Okay. So I went back there. He was in Suriyan at that time. I went to him in Suriyan. He said, please, you know, I'd like to live in a cave in the mountain of Suriyan. He looked at me and said, but there is no water. How will you take the water? He said, ah, I'll carry the water on my back. 
You know, in the Ustan there is a story. One monk, he lives far from the water. His cave is very far from the water. And every day he has to go walking a long way to take the water. After some time he says, let me, let me move my cave closer to the water. So he pack up his things and he start to move. And he meets a man coming this way, glorious looking man. He said to him, who are you? He said, oh, I am the angel counting your steps. How many steps you will take for the water? This how many crowns you will get. So he was happy, the man, he took his cave farther from the water. <laughs> very far. So, I was telling the Pope this story, so happy, he said, if you, if you carry the water, you can stay in the cave, like a condition. Okay, this was enough for me. Came back here, I told them, the justice, yes, Pope agreed. Start to look for a cave here, there's many caves down in the Wadi, okay? But they are not nice because they are in the, you are just in a sandbank here, a sandbank here and a sandbank here and you are in a cave in the middle. He said, no, oh, I want a cave up like some mountain, next to a mountain. No, they told me there is no cave. Then, one month, he told me there was here in Ethiopia, of course, by the He stayed one year in the monastery, I just visited him. Then he spent the 40 days of the holy fast in the mountain. I can show you his cave. So he took me up there. It's, it's in between, halfway from St. Paul Church to St. Anthony, so it's fairly high. But you climb up. The first, did you see my path? When you go up, up the steps, there's a snake path going on this side. This is the way to my place. But after the path, you have to climb. You have to climb up the rocks. There's no steps and no. It's just climbing, hands and knees. But when I got there, small cave, which you okay. I went inside. I sat down to pray Jesus' prayer to see how I feel. And I found a wooden cross there which Father Musa left. So I picked it up and I felt a shock, like electric shock, like static. I dropped it. Then I picked it up a second time and I feel more of this shock. I put it down and I shake my hand. Then the third time, okay, I can hold it. I start to think, what is the meaning of this? How this power stay in the cross? Only can be the prayer of Father Musa, was so strong. Maybe he was making his metania with this cross. So I said, okay, let me, let me take the blessing of this man and stay here. So <coughs> I um, came down, I told him, he was to say, take the cape of Father Musa. So, okay. Took some boys, workers here in the monastery. We carried up some cement and sand and water. And we made a door. And a small the cave is a natural cave in, like this. Like a ship, like a room. Just like the womb of St. Mary. You see the icon? Sometimes you see Jesus in her room and his face inside her room. When I'm in my cave I feel exactly like that. The cave is just around me like that. And I'm sitting there to make my prayer inside the room of St. Mary. So, just made a small kitchen outside the little room. I make Colin Soros there. It's my work to make this. Even I make for a woman. So, when I'm making the Colin Soros, I sit in the, because there's some light there. In the little kitchen, I make, I make a, have a gas bottle, I make coffee. So, I start to live there. And it was the night that I wanted to to begin my, my life there, it was the beginning of the fast of Great Lent, okay, the next year. So, I, I, I really, I wanted the anniversary to be the first day of my life in the mountain to be the first day of Great Lent. Right, the door wasn't ready. Everything else was ready, but the door was still in the workshop here. It hasn't finished the carpenter to make it. But I was determined to sleep there, so I went up and I stayed there. I pray the 11th hour from the Igbe, and I sit down outside. And the sun was setting, so I start to pray. I said, Mom, help me, I have to sleep here, there's no door. So don't let anything bad come to get me. There's wild dogs, there's uh, snakes, all, 
all sorts of things can come. So I was looking down and I saw down at the bottom of the valley. My cave is high, right? And down at the bottom of the valley, I saw a figure moving, not walking, but floating on the little bit above the ground. He came across and he stood in front of me, right down in the bottom of the valley. Hello, Father. So, it was it was like a figure with a like a white uh, galibea and white collar and so on, a smoky figure, smoky light. But I thought, what can it be? Because the ark he doesn't have a collar and so on, and the monk is dressed in black. So why is it white? And this? But it was a smoky figure. You couldn't see much. Then he turned. When he turned, I saw a long beard. Yes, an Anthony, it was. I couldn't see exactly his features, but I could see the, the face was not old, not broken, and still, still strong, and a long beard. And then he made like this, sort of blessing with his hand, and then he passed away. So I knew that he came to bless me, my Nushiri, wel welcome my son to be in the mountain. Eh? So I slept like a baby. No, 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 <laughs> no dogs, no snakes, no, no scorpion, nothing. In the morning, I got up, started my life. My, I made a, the roof of my cave is flat. You know why? Because in the Bustan, you know, Amasara, Amasara, she made her cave next to the river, and she made the top flat, the roof flat, and she made her matanias and make her prayer on the roof. And she stayed there 60 years and she never looked at the river once. Okay, I said to her, why? She said, because if I take my eye to the creative thing, the beauty of the creative thing, I take it away from the creator. So, me, of course, I look at the mountain, I'm not like her, but <laughs> still I make my metal on the roof facing the, the sky. And everything came into place. My prayer, I pray there by the hours, you know, six o'clock in the morning. I, I get up and I go on the roof and I pray uh, morning, first hour. Okay? Psalm 19, what does it say? And the sun, like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber to, for, to make his run his race, he start at one end of the heaven and I look down here to the Red Sea and he make his course to the other end of the heaven. And I look over here to the parliament, and nothing is hidden from the heat, or my cave not hidden from the heat. So by the place, by the wide desert, I'm reading the Psalms and I'm finding the meaning there, in front of me. You know? Uh, then I go to build things, walls. <coughs> I build so many walls in front of my cave. When you come there, you can't see. If you are down and you look up, you just see the mountain. You don't see my cave and my door. And hidden everything, camouflage, but for labor and for physical work. Nine o'clock I pray third hour. After that I make column so. Twelve o'clock I pray six hour. Then I prepare for the evening. Then three o'clock eating. If I'm tired I sleep another hour. Then four or five o'clock uh, sunset prayer and complaint prayer and maybe the, the gospel and the pieces of the sata. Then I sleep from 7.30 or 8 till 10.30. 10.30 I get up, I finish quickly the precept solution. Then I go outside and I wait. There's a certain spot, sit on a rock. From that rock, if I look down, I can see the road at the bottom of the steps here. Father Timotheus, he comes from the monastery and he comes up and just before he goes to the steps, he shines his torch. And me, I'm waiting up there and I shine my torch. 
so our touch signal connecting like this. So that means that he's coming with the with the holy grail with the korban. So I go quickly up the mountain and go to the chaos and in my side by the mountain. And he goes up the steps. And he arrives in St. Paul. He takes three holy bread and give it to the boys. He keeps three boys with him and three boys come up to me. And I pray the, the liturgy in the chaos at midnight. Finish at uh, 2.30. Go back to my cave, sleep till... Uh, if I need to finish the long psalm or any pieces from the midnight hour which I didn't finish. Finish them and then sleep till 6 o'clock again. So, by prayer, by the rhythm of the prayer of the day, through the day my day passes. With the night time, yeah. This is enough, shining on me, go to the cave and pray the next. Uh, this, this midnight mass is giving like, like the power to be free of the earth. Because to go there, I have to walk on the summit, the flat top of the mountain. And when a full moon, like last night, it's full moon. So all of the body is the moonlight. And I, on the top of the mountain, like me and the moon together, we are looking down and everything. See? And, 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 and lift it to heaven. This is the blessing of the, the mountain. That when you are running free in the mountain, like you are running with all mountains, like you are just, just free of your body. Before I was so heavy when I was in Australia. I can't walk anywhere. I take the car or go in the ascensor. But here, I'm running all over the mountain. Like I mean, I'm not going. Because this is great. All of my life now, driven by grace, not by anything. Father Tim Thayers, he, uh, he, he said he died. Mm -hmm. When we go up the steps, he never walk on the steps. He always go on the side. I tell him, why they make steps? Why you don't walk on the steps? <laughs> okay. Sure enough, after some time, he fell down and broke his leg. And I laughed. I tell him, see, I told you. <laughs> hey, how many times I told you, I'm going to walk on the steps and you did it. Okay. I'm not sy sympathizing with you, no. Three months he had to stay here. He couldn't come. After the three months, he feel better and start to come up to the mountain. Or tell me he's going to come. So, all of these three months, I was staying in my cave in the, all the night. And I was praying that Jesus prayed with the, with the center. I can tell you about that, but that's something else. Then, now I have to stop it. I was so happy with that prayer. So, so beautiful. Now I have to stop it to go out, to go to the mats. And you know, it's often so windy. The wind coming from the Red Sea is so strong. I have to crawl on my hands and knees. I can't walk upright. Sometimes I'm suffering physically to be there in the mountain. Many times I fall down. When I come, I'm very frightened to do Lacan because when Bishop put the water here, I have to show him all my cuts. <laughs> but I don't like to show him my cut feet. So, it's sometimes difficult. So, after these three months, I was a bit late. I said, okay, let me not go. Let me stay here. Then I said, okay, I'll read the Bible. So I opened the Bible. What is the... <coughs> I open it like this, you know, random. I open it like, what is the first verse I read? What? Peter, you couldn't watch with me one hour? <laughs> <laughs> Close the Bible, put on the hey, Galibea, the rough Galibea, and I go out. Okay, okay, I get a message, I'm going. <laughs> on the way, you know what I saw? It's on the darkness kind of black, but not exactly black, right? There's a little bit of light in it. But this night, two or three places, as I was climbing up the mountain, I saw absolutely jet black spot, like this, like, have you seen that picture of Jesus? Yeah. So, you don't see it very often, but he's praying, and he 
Das ist Eis auf der Eis. Nein. Eis so, das fick an Eis. Es ist like he's kneeling in prayer. I couldn't, just because it was dark. Black, black, black. So I was running towards it to see, and it moved. And it did this two or three times while I was going to the cave of St. Anthony. And then I started the Mass and the prayer. You know the part in the Mass where the priest have to lift up the, the chalice and have to say, uh, and after supper he took the cup and mixed wine and water. You have to lift it to make a shape of a cross. When I did that, you know, I, I hear a voice say to me, this is the cup you didn't want to, to take. So ashamed in my life, I've never been so ashamed like that night when I, I nearly stayed in my cave and not to make this this uh, offering, not to make this uh, blessing, this cup. Uh, so now, whatever condition is, whether I go, whatever condition me, I go. I have to go. This is my my life sentence. What I do. this is my job to go. The, to the mass in the midnight, have to, must be. But around it, there is so much grace. So I'm not, I'm not really sad of this. I'm happy, happy of it. So if you have any question, this is what I'm doing now, like this, living there. Seeing with the three months when you didn't go to the liturgy, you said something happened. You this might talk about it later. This is about the No, it's just about the Jesus prayer. You know what is the Jesus prayer? Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Do you pray this or not? Yes. Yeah. I think Coptic do not know this really. prayer very much. Yeah. But this is the Eastern Orthodox prayer more. Five minutes and then you This prayer, you know, is a mystery, mystery, mystical prayer. You, know? you can pray it just by saying, Lord Jesus Christ have mercy on me, Lord Jesus Christ have God have mercy on me. And that's good. That's very good. No problem. And I advise you to say it. And if you are driving, if you are shopping, if you are doing anything, if you are even, you are writing your study. So when you come to a full stop, you can pause and say, Lord Jesus, mercy on me, then continue. And at any time, whatever you're doing, you can use this prayer to, for mindfulness. Mindfulness, huh? to be remembering Jesus. But there's another way to pray it, which I pray, which I learned in Mount Athos. Mystical way. Okay? To take you out of your body, so that you, you lift up your soul, like it says in the Mass, if your heart, hearts to God, they are with the Lord. I know what is the meaning of this. This means that you live. St. Paul said, I know a man, I don't know the body or out of the body. And he went to the third heaven. He said he saw things not suitable for the cup of man to utter. No, I didn't say anything. But what happens to me? When I pray this prayer, if I start say midnight, and I pray till two o'clock. After fifteen minutes, I I feel hot, and my body become like fire, and I feel that I'm light, that I'm uh, no weight at all, like what the astronaut, when the gravity is not existing anymore. So, the prayer, and the prayer, only thing existing. I'm having no thought and no feeling. Only Jesus. Only this, this idea of Jesus. Huh? Completely overtaking me. This is the state of the absorption in the prayer. The mystical state. Huh? Maybe this will last for half an hour or one hour or one and a half hours. And you feel it like five minutes. You don't know how long this time passed. Because, you see, you have to sit in a way like this. Yeah. We have here a bone. Okay? In both of these knees you have a bone here. And here you have a bone. Okay? Temple bone. You are supposed to cut 
this bone onto this bone and this bone onto this bone and then you press and you pray and if you do like that where is your eyes your eyes looking to your heart so you start to, and your breath you can't breathe easily huh? you breathe in Lord Jesus Christ you breathe in the name and you hold it and you say son of God because yeah, Jesus said to Peter who, who, who am I who do men say that I am and then he said who do you say that I am so you must have said you are son of God so you, you breathe in the name here is the first day here to see you son of God and you breathe out your sins have mercy you breathe in the name you fill yourself with the name of Jesus you confess that he is son of God and then you breathe out your sin if you do like this you become pure you become clean you have nothing evil in you nothing no sin can hide in you and then your your body starts to, to become like a circle like God your prayer going around from your lips from your mind to your mouth to your heart and back like a circle so the purity of the prayer follow the purity of your body like the circle and God is a circle because there is there is no beginning and there is no end to the circle so you make your body like a circle like uh, the fetus again in the womb of St. Mary eh? that's why I like this icon because Jesus inside St. Mary so this is mystical brain but this is not for every day don't try it because if you don't have the preparation preparation of the life in the desert you cannot do it but you can say the Jesus prayer you can say Lord you know Vasula Ryder you know who is she? Vasula Ryder she is a Greek prophetess she was a model and then she she left that life and she came to Jesus but she used to say that do everything with Jesus now one day she was going for shopping she went to the bus she got on the bus and she bought one ticket but she sat down in a seat and there were two seats here so this seat was empty and she said look Lord we, we only bought one ticket and we are two we are occupying we are not occupying the others. Jesus said to her Masula don't you know that we are united at one? We are only one, we are not two. You see? So everywhere she went and everything she did, Jesus did it with her, in her. So anybody, even any one of you, if you live pure and you follow what you are called to follow, by all of Jesus' words. On plus, in addition, if you love, if you love, 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 love with all of your heart, then the grace will come. And when you get the grace, you will you'll be free. Before that, you will be in chains. Like St. Paul said, I am the prisoner for the Lord. Then the Lord cannot make you free you have to follow the Lord you have to follow the commandments like it says in the long psalm I, your laws are my delight I meditate on them I, ok, but after that what? after that grace you follow the Lord and then you love and by love you will give grace and by grace you will be saved
every every icon which I, which I saw in my life, they take some for you. So I always keep those. Come back, I came just in time. Yeah, just in time. So this is from, uh, from many, many different churches, many different authors, but all combined. So we take it.